Um, hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. So I have, uh, we have here today a friend who needs no introduction because I'm sure, sure everybody in this room uh, knows him quite well. Um, I'm very honored to introduce my friend and our former colleague, Luca Pischkoretz. Um, I hope I said his last name correctly. Uh, here back at the ETH Zurich, um, uh, Luca um, studied architecture at the University of Zagreb and then he continued studying here at ETH Zurich at the Department of Architecture. Um, and afterwards he joined Gramazza Kohler Research and led their teaching activities for a long time uh, and then continued again with teaching activities, leading the teaching um, of Gramazza Kohler of the, for the MAS program uh, here until last year. And uh, since 2017, he's now working as a lecturer at uh, Alto University in Helsinki um, for the design uh, of structures program. Um, Luca also uh, is part of uh, the TEN Association, a Zurich-based association dedicated to uh, initiation and promotion of cultural ventures. And uh, they've exhibited their works at the Swiss Art Awards in 2018. Um, so um, I now give the mic uh, back to Luca, and I hope you enjoy his lecture. Thank you. I have my mic attached to my head already. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm glad to be back. I actually came back in uh, May, shortly. Um, we worked on a small project that I will also present to you, uh, present to you um, during the presentation. But uh, yeah, it's kind of nice to be back. Um, so I live now in Finland, and uh, the holidays already started. So I'm officially on holidays. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm glad to kind of spend some time with you here. Um, I will. Uh, you probably some of you realized, or probably 80% of you realized, I actually held a lecture in September here, which was eight months ago, um, so I couldn't do exactly the same presentation, so I decided basically to, there's kind of the first part that I uh, cramped up with uh, kind of uh, some new stuff that I didn't show yet, some of it is super, super new. Um, a lot of it is preliminary, because I basically started uh, research activities uh, at the Aalto University in Helsinki, and sort of... Um, um, I mean, you will see kind of what we are doing there or what I am personally trying to do there also with the students. Plus, uh, I will present a little bit my kind of hobby activities that I have uh, with the group that is here in Zurich. We founded in 2015, so I think in the last lecture I just hinted at some of the stuff that we were doing together, but um, um, yeah, I will now present maybe some, a little bit more in depth, and that's going to be half of the lecture, and then the other half is going to be uh, maybe some familiar stuff that you maybe saw. I hope I won't bore you, I kind of shortened it a bit, but I put it there to kind of complete, basically. So that's kind of the last, let's say, six to seven years of my, or seven to eight years of kind of my work here. So I also wanted to kind of pack it together. Uh, okay, so we will start with... Um, so the title is Computational Production Paradigms and Design Aug Augmentation. Um, Production paradigms are uh, specifically related to digital fabrication, robotic fabrication, and design augmentation is um, now something that kind of interests me more and more. It's going to be actually the first part of the lecture. Um, and it specifically involves AI. I actually, I know that there are some people here who, mm, not some, but few, that are very uh, skilled in this field, so I'm rather new. But uh, basically, I uh, kind of uh, try to educate myself and... Um, I'll kind of present now a little bit kind of the, let's say, the research trajectory uh, for me and, and our group um, in the, la let's say, the next, well, three, four, five years. Um, we are looking into some, some things. Um, okay, so uh, probably you noticed that in the last, let's say, since maybe 2012, there was this kind of boom in AI research, uh, primarily... Um, driven by industry, so big firms like Google, Facebook, and so on, uh, proliferating through kind of more and more sort of uh, academic research, but most of the stuff is st uh, now being done in, 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 uh, in companies. And um, some of the, there's this 2012 that I will mention again why this happened, but basically kind of in the, we are in the right 
age to uh, to kind of progress, or there was a reason why this boom happened exactly at this time, and it's kind of a combination of these three. Also, there's kind of a computer power. So it turns out that um, a research is driven by kind of linear algebra and matrix multiplications and so on, and and the, these can be uh, very easily run on GPUs. Um, so of course, it, uh, GPUs were primarily designed to run graphics. So somehow, you know, have gaming and uh, film industry basically driving the technology in order to, uh, that we are now basically using for AI research. Um, then there's data. There's a lot more data around with Facebook and Google and so on. So this is kind of also something new. Uh, in order to train machine learning models, you need a lot of data. And somehow, uh, this whole culture of open source. So um, there's a lot of stuff online. You can learn it on your own, basically. You can learn it in universities, and somehow code is sh shareable. So it's very easy to share and exchange, and uh, a lot of the AI research is basically open source. Um, this is also a little bit kind of how I learned it. So I am um, kind of have to redo my uh, kind of going back to school to learn some of these things. And um, this is a kind of a, a statement that you can challenge me on that, but this is sort of my preliminary thing. So or pre pre preliminary assumption. Um, so I kind of claim that there are these three paradigms in digital design. Um, the first one is manual drawing and modeling, which is very similar to um, actually how a lot of uh, architects and artificial offices still work today. So they use a computer basically like a drawing board. The second one is I think most of you here are either operating this paradigm or you are trained to or are learning here how to operate in this paradigm, so generation through instructions. So we don't draw things manually, we uh, show computers how to, or we basically tell computers how to draw for us. So it's a kind of, it's still drawing, it's still modeling, but uh, it's a lot more powerful, and it really uses the capabilities of computer to facilitate design. And again, kind of bold statement, but I'll just kind of put it here. Generation through examples. So somehow this promise of AI today is that you don't necessarily, so there are techniques today where you don't have to even tell the computer exactly how to do something. You teach it the way you teach uh, a human how to do something. So I could kind of, uh, so you teach the computer through uh, examples. You would give uh, 10,000 uh, images of 10,000 chairs to the computer and we tell it, okay, here's the chair. I actually have no idea how to build it. I just collected these photos. But here, you know, these are all the photos. Um, try to kind of create a chair that is not one of these. Um, and it turns out that computers are powerful today, that they can actually do this. There's, uh, and they do this with machine learning. So um, it's also a little bit similar how humans learn, or um, kind of learning by observation and imitation, in a sense, and extrapolation. Um, um, I don't know how much you work in Photoshop, but I was quite surprised when I realized that I have a portrait photo, I have to make it square. And uh, you know this fill content aware? Uh, so this is filled up by Photoshop, the shoulders. So Photoshop just assumes <laughs> that the shoulders look like this and it has to continue. Yeah. So somehow these tools are basically already here. In, for processing um, images, they are already kind of around. Um, they're kind of a bit sneaky, hidden away, but you can do also in Photoshop quite a lot of other very cool stuff. And uh, it's kind of, and this is actually something new, or so it's somehow um, when you do manual manipulation of images, it is very easy to fall out of, uh, so I quote here the paper, basically, manifold of natural images. Or So if I would have done this by hand, I'd have to be a pretty skilled artist to reconstruct this shoulder, even a simple task like this. So um, it is not actually an easy task even for humans, but somehow computers can do it, um, or now can do it. Um, there's this paper by uh, Engelbart, um, who's kind of one of the pioneers of well, AI research and kind of human-machine interaction. His research uh, directly um, led to the invention of the mouse. Um, and he uh, wrote this kind of report basically in 62, uh, kind of augmenting, augmenting human intellect. And kind of the idea is basically, you know, we have this intelligence augmentation through technology. Um, um, artificial intelligence, and then basically, um, you know, maybe you could get something like artificial intelligence aug augmentation. So the idea is that uh, we not make 
So the tools that we use, the computers that we use, uh, can actually make us smarter. And of course, in our context, they can make us better designers. Again, this is ETH, so I don't have to go so much in detail and tell you about this. So this is basically also what you're trying to, trying to do in our daily lives. Um, this is some of the pioneers of AI research. It means Marvin Minsky and Claude Shannon um, here. Um, so all this basically started in the 60s. And um, kind of quick division, so it's actually quite a large field. So machine learning is basically how you know, algorithms that are able to deduce, um, that are able to basically deduce patterns um, from, um, from collected data. In a sense, I heard somewhere someone calling it a glorified uh, statistics. Um, so there's kind of two big groups, supervised and unsupervised learning, and um, there are kind of a lot of different models. And uh, the most famous ones are, of course, neural networks, but a lot of these other ones uh, actually score much higher for s very specific tasks. Um, and this field has, is basically developing since the 60s, so neural networks are nothing new. So they were basically invented in the 60s. Um, so this kind of... Um, yeah, in, um, these models were basically um, invented back then, but the issue is we didn't have, you know, there's three things, uh, power, <laughs> data, so we didn't have enough data and we definitely didn't have enough power. So it was very hard to, uh, to do these calculations. But basically, in, I'll, spec I'll, over, or I'll uh, kind of explain a little bit how neural networks work. Um, it's basically um, kind of neuron is a computational unit that just uh, calculates the weighted average of its inputs and produces one single output. And when you stack them in layers, or when you uh, arrange them in layers, this is called a fully connected layer, um, or fully connected network, meaning that every neuron from one layer is connected to every neuron to the other layer. Um, and basically, these are just matrix multiplications, so kind of dot products. Um, there's a weight matrix on one side, uh, multiplied by the kind of all the inputs um, times biases, I think, bias, ve bias vector, and then you go from layer to layer. Um, so they're actually very fast to calculate with, today, uh, with uh, GPUs today because basically all the polygons uh, in 3D graphics are um, uh, basically matrix calculations, so transformations in space. Um, but there's something remarkable uh, about neural networks is, is because you realize at one moment that these uh, neural networks can be used to model any continuous function. So it's called the universal approximation theorem. Um, so um, you can model basically or simulate any continuous function to a desired, um, to a desired um, precision or a desired resolution. Of course, this is not a... So the kind of theorem was proven in the 80s and it's not it's not very efficient, so somehow the, the bulk of AI research today is basically about how to uh, make this, um, this kind of learning or basically make these uh, uh, translation of functions uh, if more efficient, because otherwise it's actually quite an inefficient process. Um, so that's kind of back propagation algorithms and so on. So the 2012, we had this kind of breakthrough um, where AlexNet uh, used... Um, convolutional neural network uh, to train images, and basically it's, uh, uh, ImageNet is this kind of big um, um, competition in recognizing uh, labeled data, so labeled images online. And uh, some of before AlexNet, uh, it was it always had kind of a 25% error rate, which is actually quite, quite high. But since then, we managed to get to basically 5% error rate, error rate, or I think even lower for certain classes. So yeah, now we have computers that can recognize images recognize what is kind of on images. And I won't go too much into this, but I have some diagrams after this, so kind of explain some just very few concepts. So convolutional neural networks, what they do, they basically recognize features on the image. And specifically, they recognize high-level features. And um, it's kind of a whole process how this is done. So you know, maybe now I have this kind of process of drawing everything, so I kind of went through this very slowly. Convolution is nothing else but kind of a filter on an image. It reduces the dimensionality um, of, of an image and extracts basically a so-called feature value or feature vector. And then when you stack a lot of them together, you basically get kind of a feature, feature volume um, or kind of this, um, I think I have it here, yeah. So it's kind of a feature volume. And this, so it's, it's um, 
It's just a computational process with which you can basically reduce the dimensionality of your, of your images specifically, but basically any, any data. And you map it to a latent space which um, corresponds actually to high level features. So, um, for example, you know, being a cat or being a dog is a high level feature, um, which is very hard to describe in, in terms of pixels, but uh, we all know, you know what the concepts mean. Um, so, somehow, you can, use, um, you can use this basically feature ec extraction to kind of train. And basically, this is what you start then when you train your neural networks. So, you never start with the raw image. Otherwise, you're too inefficient. There are just way too many pixels uh, around. Um, and uh, yeah, so you kind of reduce this dimensionality of the image or of your data. And then you can also go back. Or, so you can kind of go from this feature space. Ah, yeah, one very important aspect of this is that uh, these, are, these features are, um, they have this translational invariance. That means if a feature happens anywhere on the image, it will kind of be recorded. So it doesn't matter where the feature happens. In that sense, this, um, this was directly inspired by how our visual cortex works. Because if you see a cat, it doesn't matter if the cat is here or here or here or here. You know, the cat in the view is the cat in the view. So no matter where you have kind of the cat, the, you could kind of get sort of positive feature here, meaning there is a ca cat somewhere on the image. And this proved to be actually quite, um, quite successful when you do image recognition, at least. Um, yeah, so there's this idea of, of, of encoders. So basically, you can go from, from, um, from this kind of data to this latent feature space and back. Um, and uh, you do this with variational auto encoders. Or so you can kind of go from a low D latent space to the actual uh, raw data that you inputted in. And, um, and basically, these auto encoders, they're basically learning. Um, they're learning a kind of an abstract high level model of, um, of what the data is or what the data represents. And this makes them, this makes it possible to generalize beyond the examples that, that were shown. Um, so some neural networks are able to generalize um, very successfully, that is. And we actually still don't know why exactly why this is so, but somehow they are. Um, and you know, this is also not a completely new idea because this is again how science works. Or so we uh, science basically generalizes. So you have kind of a noisy world, and you yeah, basically perform some kind of regression. So you say, okay, I have this noise, but basically the underlying principle, uh, the underlying rules are much simpler, and this is the formula, you know? So you are able to, and then you can use this formula to generalize on the examples that you don't know. For example, you know, calculating ballistic trajectories and so on. So somehow this is not a completely new idea. Uh, then a lot of this research was then done on this kind of um, basically MNIST um, data set, which is basically handwritten, um, hand digit, hand digits. Uh, and if you ever filled out Swiss taxes, they tell you specifically don't use a typewriter, write it by hand, because their models are trained to recognize human writing, not a typewriter. Um, and uh, the idea is that then you can kind of, so this is basically the image of this latent space, or so this is specifically kind of. Um, all the hand digits are sort of clustered around, and different clusters represent different, different digits. So they're all a little bit different because we all write things a little bit differently, but you can kind of clearly sort them. Um, and so that's kind of standard clustering, but what variational autoencoders do, they, uh, they make this feature space or latent space uh, continuous. So they're, they're able to actually to fill in the gaps. So, you know, here you can go kind of, so these are just hand digits, so you go from this is seven, this is four, six, and here is, I think this is zero. And you can kind of start interpolating in between. So you can kind of sample every point in between this latent space and kind of gets it, get its um, kind of raw, raw representation or image representation. Um, and not only that, but you know, when I have, for example, fonts, so I have kind of average bolded fonts and kind of bold fonts. I can, in this feature space, which of course uh, has many dimensions, we can create vectors. We can have kind of bolding vector. It just connects these, or the centers of these two clusters. And now this bolding vector is basically a high level, it's a high level, or it's a, it's a vector that applies kind of a high level function on your, on, to your image. So in, a, in that sense, you know, if you look at um, just kind of fonts, bolding is not really a straightforward uh, action, or because you're allowed, you have to bold, 
the letter, but you're not allowed to go beyond the lines above and so on. So it's not exactly straightforward how you bolden fonts, but this bolding vector kind of contains all of that information. In theory, you can use it to bold letters um, under certain assumptions. You can also use it to um, can use this idea kind of to basically, you know, how your autocomplete works on your messaging and so on. Um, this is basically kind of reducing the number of words in a sentence. With my favorite book, by the way, uh, reducing the number of words in a sentence, um, but kind of still trying to retain the meaning uh, of the sentence as much as that's possible. Um, so we can kind of train neural networks to basically do this, or this is a specifically, I think, recurrent neural network. Um, yeah, so we have kind of high-level features that uh, we can kind of add and subtract. Or so you have a, we have face without glasses vector. We have a vector, you know, face with glasses. The kind of difference is basically the glasses vector. So I can use that to sort of add glasses onto an image because the glasses, you know, having glasses, this is a high level feature. Or it's not exactly, if you, do, if you, uh, if you would uh, look at it just from the, um, if you would look at it just from the kind of as a single processing task, it is not exactly trivial how, for example, you remove glasses from the image from my face. Um, but these techniques are able to do it, or because glasses, there is kind of a vector through which you can add it to the face or you can subtract it from the face. And um, yeah, it's not exactly that easy. So there's a lot of research now being done. Turns out I gave you a simplified version, but you know, there are certain potentials there. Um, and um, so I talked about variational autoencoders. There I see kind of potential to be used in, in our work. The other ones are um, GANs or generative adversarial networks. And they basically have two networks, and they are kind of competing against each other. So, um, so for you have the generator, and the generator is trying to generate images, like fake images. And the discriminator is trained already, trained on certain, um, trained on a data set. And the discriminator is basically trying to figure out if the image that the generator produced is fake or the real one. So the generator is drawing randomly fake images or real uh, images from the real data set. And of course, at the beginning, it's very easy to distinguish between them because the generator is not very good. But the generator can learn. So the generator basically uses the sort of the, it is the, um, the gradient of this kind of neural network so um, to, to basically make itself better. Um, so the generator can basically uh, improve itself through time. And then you can go to crazy things. So you can, for example, reconstruct so you can use, for example, GANs for reconstructing uh, three-dimensional objects from two-dimensional images. And if, you know, I give you a 2D image, so this is, this is an MIT paper. I give you a 2D image, I give you, um, 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 so I give a 2D uh, image to the computer, and the computer can kind of reconstruct a three-dimensional um, object, even though there are, of course, some inclusions uh, or occlusions. And again, you wonder how you can do this, because, you know, the human can do it. If I give you an image of a chair, you saw so many chairs, you can kind of probably deduce how it could look like in 3D, especially if you're an architect or a, or a designer. Or you can use it to kind of just generate fake faces. Or, again, to kind of interpolate between data, fonts, and so on. And this is uh, specifically, this was done on drawings. So this is kind of maybe that is more interesting for us. So these are actually not pixel drawings, these are vector drawings. And, uh, you know, if you give 10,000 drawings of a cat to a computer, it can kind of start figuring out how the cat should look like. So you can start interpolating uh, between, so here you have only kind of four images on the corner and everything else is interpolated from the, from the data set. Um, and you can, you know, you can basically, you don't have to input random noise to the generator. You can already kind of give it some directions, what, how, in which direction should be, uh, in which direction should uh, this data kind of be generated from the beginning. And you kind of have these basically, are called kind of subs or kind of latent subspace or of images, for example. This is my latent space. There is a kind of a line that connects all the mountain photos there uh, in, in that sense. And of course, you saw these examples, so uh, you can use it for style, style transfer. And um, this is almost finished with this, this or I almost finished with, with this part. Uh, you know, so the question is, why am I researching this or why is I decided to kind of show you this is because somehow um, I think there is a potentially, or now there's kind of maybe a right time to go into this field because somehow also the data that is becoming available and the focus is not only, you know, recognizing 
or distinguishing between cats and dogs. It is also, or there, there is a lot of data that we as architects can use. So this is just one example. So House 3D is basically Facebook's database. Um, I think it says somewhere, yeah, Facebook AI, basically 45, thousand human design 3D scenes are available now online with these depth maps, so you can use them directly to train to train your models. And of course this um, the intention of this is of course to train robots that move around the houses and so on. So they can recognize furniture, doors and so on. But you know, this data is out there, it can be down, downloaded. So you know it's kind of potentially we can use it. And um, I'm not trying to kind of advertise now or anything, but kind of, you know, the, there's something cool about neural models because they are kind of hard to train. Specifically, we have no efficient backpropagation algorithm. Yet, we have something. Um, it's not very efficient, but then again, we are also not very efficient learners. You know, it takes us kind of a few years to, or one year to learn how to walk and so on. So you can think, okay, may, maybe we cannot do better. But they are fast to ex execute. Or So the kind of, um, um, to do the actual Classification through a neural network is super fast because it's just simple matrix multiplications. You can parallelize it on GPUs. That's it. That's why there are JavaScript libraries that work on your browser that do this. Um, but of course, the models have to be trained before. So once when they are trained, they can be deployed very efficiently. Yeah, there are of course obstacles. So we need large data sets, um, which. Uh, Images is fine because everybody likes to photograph themselves and put it online. Um, this has to be labeled data. Uh, yeah, but for you know, for our cases, maybe we are kind of missing some data sets, and input data is too heavy. So we have to kind of create algorithms to basically extract these high-level features. So we cannot work directly with pixel images, and we cannot work directly with 3D models, or because one Rhino 3D model can be 500 megabytes, and that's just one. Uh, one data point. So, you know, that's way too big to work. So we have to kind of work on these algorithms to extract these features. Okay, um, connected to this is this kind of, uh, or, you know, the reason now I gave this whole introduction was, of course, I I'm personally interested in geometry. And this, I call, so this is a bit of pre preliminary, um, preliminary um, title. I call it highly, highly connected le lattices. Um, and uh, there's, this, there's this concept of basically how we can represent, represent topology or topology in, in, um, in, in 3D models. So this is a so-called sparse matrix. Um, this is basically a way to represent um, systems of linear equations. Um, and yeah, you have a linear equation, uh, kind of the form of matrix, the, the non-null terms become kind of one or they become dots, and this is how you can kind of visualize them. So they're kind of, uh, they're used in maths and applied mathematics to, to, visualize, uh, to visualize this kind of very complex sort of uh, numerical uh, models. Of course, this is always mirrored. So actually, all the information is just on one side. Um, you can use color to say, you know, have some terms are bigger, some are smaller, so I kind of color, color code it. Um, and this is actually used, so, this is used, for example, in chemistry. They use it to classify molecules. And in a very specific way, so they use this Coulomb, Coulomb matrix. And um, it also has this um, permutation invariance. That means it doesn't matter how you kind of, how you start to label the molecules, uh, you will always kind of get the single sort of feature out. And now you can use your um, machine learning models to, to train on this E, basically, at the end. So you don't train on this, you train it on the kind of the features that are extracted. And the question is, what are these features, if you work with, you know, now three-dimensional geometry, how do we, how do we reduce, how do we reduce it, how do you extract these either high-level features, or how do you kind of reduce the dimensionality of these models? Um, so there were some attempts, so Mark Pauli has this um, concept called shape space. Shape space, so you can have a look at it on his um, as a lecture also online, where basically the whole mesh is sort of mapped as one-dimensional, or uh, single point in high, dimen high dimensional space, and you can use this to perform optimizations. So this is one way. I'm not sure if this actually reduces the dimensionality, but uh, it uh, changes the re 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 representation of the, of the model. R. So somehow the way you represent data uh, matters. And this was kind of then my attempt. So this is a kind of a fractal three-dimensional model, and this is its connection matrix. Uh, it's actually not complete, so I wrote here it's trimmed because it would have to be very, very big. So I just uh, did like first 40 terms. Um, 
So that's it. There are all the nodes uh, listed in two axes, and these are the connections between the nodes. And of course, they're always connected to itself, and this is just mirrored. So it's just one line for this model. Uh, but this is just the topology information. Also. And of course, you can go, the deeper you go, the, the bigger your matrix is. Or, but it's kind of very simple, or it's just one single line. And you can go, you can extend it. Okay, now we use that to kind of create surfaces. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, kind of, I think there are some relevance to these models. Um, so I'm actually looking at some of the examples there. Basically, here we are looking at uh, models, or the idea is, or for me, the idea was to look at the models which have, um, um, let's say, very hi like highly complex um, connections between the, between the elements, or where there is no repetition. So here, specifically, there is repetition, but um, for geometrical information, it's not directly encoded here, but you could do it basically, again, through the same technique, you use color to encode geometric information or variation of this geometrical information. So these are actually two models. And this is the matrix of this one, and this is the matrix of this one. The difference is, except the color, uh, the difference is just the angle of the line. Um, so you can actually get quite a, quite a kind of high... Um, you can take very, very complex geometry and represent it in a very, very simple way. And now, of course, the next step uh, for me is, or for the group, is kind of look, okay, what happens if we, t you know, we don't start with the model and map it into a matrix, but we actually start with the matrix itself, um, which can be highly you know, differentiated, and then we generate the models from them. You know? And this is a bit, a bit similar to what I was talking about, this uh, autoencoders. So you go from kind of raw data into some kind of latent space and, and then back. So this is kind of maybe the first step how we could start working with these, with these models. Because this specific model is this one here. I think it's 500 megabytes in Rhino. And it's just lines. <laughs> uh, yeah. So just lines, but somehow very, very big. OK. Um, and a little bit connected to this is super preliminary. But you know, then again, uh, kind of these, so why are we interested in these forms? Um, these kind of highly intricate forms. I just want to show you one fabrication technique. I don't know if you saw it ever. If you didn't, uh, maybe this is a good, then a good intro. I can actually not give you a very good intro because I myself novice here. Um, this is called actuated electroforming. It is the, the high-end technology from the 19th century, which was essentially forgotten. Um, forgotten in a sense that it was used in industry at the beginning of the 20th century, and then um, industry changed, and we are not using it anymore. Um, and today is just used by art projects, or in kind of art projects and for some very, very small. Um, yeah, there are some companies who do it for very specific things, but um, it's not, definitely not very wide, widely known. And uh, Jan Oyster basically kind of um, is an art producer who works now with this technique. So this, who of you saw this project maybe somewhere? somewhere? Okay. Uh, so this is a, looks like a piece of wood. So I'm going to just zoom it a bit. Um, and here you can see it a bit better. So this looks like wood, but it's actually not wood. This is metal. This is copper. It's completely copper, so you can fry an egg on it. Uh, in the back, when you turn it, you can see it in the back. It's, uh, you can see it kind of reveals the structure. So it's actually electroformed piece. Um, that's it. And the reason why there is kind of a difference in color here is because if you manipulate the material on a very, very fine scale, and you know there's copper, so it oxidizes, you have a bit different structure uh, of the wood, or let's say wood geometry, and this different structure causes the material to oxidize a little bit differently, and you get different patina. And it looks like, it looks like wood, but it's not. It's, it's, um, it's copper. And again, this was actually two years back, um, Biennale electroform piece. So this was a copy of a Baroque table. Um, done in the 19th century, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's again, it's completely done out of metal. Um, I think in copper, yeah, electroplated silver, and, uh, and this was basically used in the 19th century to copy objects. The idea was, uh, the world is horrible, and Europe is going to go to war, and all the monuments and artwork will be destroyed, and we have to make copies of them, have as many of them as possible around, so the, the, at least the, the copies survive, if not the original. So the kind of there was a idea, copy, copy, copy. Um, but this is basically how the process works. So it's like just very thick electroplating. You electroplate, 
very, very long, and you take out the, your, your electroplating and you get the piece. So the reason why you get such a high resolution is because this is, of course, a re resolution of silicon, um, the silicon mold. Uh, before we used the rubber, or in the 19th century, we used the rubber mold, now we use silicon. And the exact process how this is done, um, you cannot find it on the internet. So it is the company, Electroform, for example, they keep it as a secret, and Jan Oixer, the art producer, he also keeps this as a, as a secret, exactly how these coatings are done. Um, cannot be found. There are some simple techniques, but yeah. And then the idea is that basically something like this can maybe be, uh, we can do kind of controlled actuation. So this is just a sketch. But basically the idea is that maybe something similar can be used in, uh, in production of artifacts, not necessarily architectural artifacts, but um, design artifacts in that sense. And there are some, yeah, some hints how maybe this could be done. Because um, light is nothing but electromagnetic radiation, of course. And... Uh, to do this, you need uh, this is electroconducting, and look, you know. So somehow there's some real possible potentials here. And actually, this summer, um, I'm going to go. So with um, the group that we collaborate or that I collaborate with um, to Belgrade to basically work with Jan on this project specifically. So now I'll present you um, the ten group. This is actually the website. You can go and check it out. It's done by a Zurich. Um, design graphics uh, group uh, debut debut and a lot of projects that I'll show you are done together with them. But basically, ten is a um, group performed in 2015. Also, the reason why I show you this is a little bit because uh, it's kind of uh, something that was started a bit as a side project. So it's it's just um, you know ten people or now a little bit more came together, highly educated and um, very motivated, uh, very creative. And we just started working on projects together. So I'll show you some of the projects that we worked on. And now there's somehow more and more uh, things happening. And now it's uh, less of a hobby. It's, you know, has a potential to maybe become something more. But we actually do real architectural projects. Or the group is working on real architectural projects. And um, it's a bit outdated or uh, out of fashion to have manifestos. But we kind of have a manifesto. Mm. You can also check it online. So this is kind of how we identify our, ourselves, and these are our biographies. The idea is that kind of every, everything that we do, we try to kind of turn it into a story. So storytelling is very important. Somewhere here, I think I have it somewhere, we tell stories. Uh, somewhere here. <laughs> uh, telling stories is very important. Um, and, you know, this is the story of us, so our bi biographies are here. So the guys from Debut Debut, uh, they kind of scripted this as a web app, so you can kind of rearrange can randomly rearrange biographies in between, and um, the connecting text is uh, generated, or it's not generated, it's kind of pre-scripted, but basically there's always a um, connecting text between the members, how we met. So if you want to know how I met someone else, it's rearranged until we start to touch, and then you kind of learn the story. So it's a story that can be told in many different ways, because you have a lot of people, and human relationships always involve these um, kind of, you know, multiplicities of, of situations. Um, we work a lot with cultural references. So we try to, I wouldn't say compare, but we always try to kind of put things close to each other and um, or kind of put them in a different context or look at them kind of from a different context than they're, they are necessarily um, envisioned to be in at the beginning. So this is actually one architectural project, kind of interior decoration that we did um, in Belgrade. Um, so this is a gallery for Oyster uh, Belgrade. So that's actually Jan Oyster, the art producer that we are collaborating with. So we kind of designed the gallery also for him. Um, so kind of a bit standard architectural work. But we work a lot with, um, we like to work uh, with students. So most of us are teachers. We um, either studied at ETH or somehow went through ETH or are teaching at ETH at this moment. Um, uh, and um, we organized summer school since basically two, 2014, even before the group was formed. And um, there the topics were kind of very diverse. Uh, we liked basically, or we dealt mostly with kind of ur urban situations. We were looking into kind of, um, um, yeah, kind of ha looking at arrangements of specific, let's say, elements in an urban context in that sense. Um, this is another architectural project uh, that was done in Skopje for years already now. 
Um, you know, so there's Erasarinen and there's kind of a more vernacular example. It's actually the same st staircase. So somehow the elements that we work with are, especially in architecture, they're always reinvented. And we, we, we don't hide this. We, we actually try to kind of pride ourselves in the sense that you can kind of re reinvent things over and, and over. Uh, this is a project just recently finished in Nepal. So it's actually a monk's residence. Um, so it's built with uh, Buddhist monks in Thames Valley um, after the earthquake, the residence, and now actually the school also um, is kind of re rebuilt. So this is kind of project for that. Um, this was for Art Geneva a few years back, kind of a um, conceptual project. Um, again, yeah, we, we kind of we tell stories. Also, we have people like Emma Letizia Jones, she works at um, Professor Martin uh, Delbeck as chair, who's now a new professor um, at, uh, at, at the De Arch, and um, you know, um, she likes to write, so she she writes a lot. I like to draw, so we kind of draw a lot, um, and um, and yeah. Uh, kind of the idea is that uh, when you're an architect, you always kind of work in these conditions. Right? So you're inventing and reinventing and annotating, um, you know, be kind of a construction drawing or a musical score. I'll actually come to a similar comparison a bit later. Um, and of course, I specifically in a group, I'm very interested in te te technology, so kind of material and technology. So that's why, you know, I'm going to work on the electroforming project and um, this project, I think I presented it um, in September. Um, and here, I kind of, in the meantime, I kind of built a web app. So it's basically, um, um, it's in JavaScript, it's online. It's also kind of, um, my didactic goal is to move more toward open source tools. Also, I want to teach them to the, to the students more. So you can basically today do a lot from the browser. So you don't need Rhino and so on. Um, so this is kind of a automatic generation of drawings. Uh, through choosing some of the uh, some of the um, um, some of the kind of traits here, or so I can kind of go from modern house, just a bit more classical house, uh, modest, generous, introverted, open, and the text is generated aut automatically, actually generated, and it of course always makes sense and always talks uh, nice about the building. So this was the house on the Eigenschaften uh, project that we did for the. I forgot the name of, of the exhibition, but it was exhibited in Zurich. Okay, in Studiolo, this is kind of the, uh, this was now the project that we um, got the um, Swiss Art Award, um, the first prize in, ar in, in architecture this year, so it's just concluded basically last week or this week. Uh, this week uh, the piece was dismantled. So, um, so it's kind of the highest distinction that we got until now, but basically the project was, you know, we again started with cultural historical references, so we started with this investigating the idea of a studiolo. So architects, we, even when we work, we work in a context, and uh, especially architects work in a, in a context, so it's, it's always an office. This is actually Villanova Artigas, Brazilian architect, uh, who has actually nice, nice a quite nice quote or about kind of an architect who withdraws in his sort of, you know, creative space and, and creates um, creates for the public or it doesn't create for its for himself or herself, but for the public. We're actually doing the exhibition in 2019 of his drawings um, here in Zurich, so we're going to port them from Brazil. So there's also a bit of an um, advertisement for the exhibition that's going to be done then. But for this studio project, we... so. We try to work kind of with these spatial or historical references, but we also were looking for a very specific type of material. So we went to, uh, to Kunski Sarai, which is an art foundry in uh, St. Gallen. They produce art pieces for artists. Um, so they literally, you're an artist, you come there, and they can produce your art for you. So they have a lot of uh, manual know-how, and they use this material on the right. So this is Furan sand. And ah, it's actually the same sand that uh, you use for 3D printing. But when you 3D print with it, it, it it's, uh, when it's new, it's this kind of greenish, green, grayish. But when you reuse it more time, so use it for metal casting. And, um, and when you cast it more times, it becomes very black, very dark. Uh, but it's, um, it is an in-between actor in art production. So you never see it in art pieces because it's used just as a mold. You break it away, you recycle it. 
Um, but the material itself is quite fascinating. So we used, um, I forgot how many, um, I think around 10 tons of it. Uh, of course, we recycled it so we didn't have to purchase it. Um, and you would kind of think that it behaves a little bit like concrete, but not exactly because concrete is kind of liquid. This is literally like aggregate, so it's, um, it's an aggregate material. So you can just kind of pour it, solidifies in half an hour. And yeah, so it kind of looks like this. You can kind of do in this inverted mountains and so on. So it has a bit of a kind of very, very different feel than concrete itself. These are, and this was kind of then the, the piece uh, at the Swiss Art Awards in Basel. So it was only exhibited for one week, unfortunately. Um, each piece is like one and a half tons, and they kind of form sort of the outline of this studiolo, also with some kind of surface experiments that we were doing, uh, testing a little bit. So um, testing kind of the surface treatment of this material. It's not exactly Vanta black, uh, but I think it's maybe the closest that you can get uh, without <coughs> copyright infringements. Uh, okay, so... And again, the idea is, you know, it was kind of a whole project, so there's also a story behind. Of course, stories are best told by, by books. This is a cover design by W.W. Uh, of our kind of book. Unfortunately, these books are, uh, we had, I think, only 100 copies, so... Uh, not sure if they're still around, you know. You, so somehow, we had people who constructed, and then we have people who like to tell stories. So they, they we, uh, we created this story, a uh, story about... Uh, basically how kind of, you know, sort of a little bit about history, about treat, treatment of material, about blackness in that sense. Also a lot in the art context. I actually now currently find uh, art context a lot more interesting than architecture con uh, context because uh, I think they're even a bit more, they're mo more bold when it comes to production and so on. So when you're in art industry, nothing is impossible. Um, yeah, somehow everything is... Uh, Everything is in the realm of possibility. We're able to pull impossible things. So I think they're a little bit even more, uh, pr uh, a little bit more bold even than, than, than architects. Also fun people to be around. Okay, um, <laughs> disclaimer. So this is kind of the, this is the, the old and new stuff. Have a little bit of old stuff. I supplemented it a little bit, uh, but um, but yeah, if you were here in September, you might find a lot of things uh, similar, but I shortened it and sub supplemented something, so I'll kind of try to also not make it very, very boring. There are just kind of a uh, few parts now. So this one I call measurement and production, historical overview. Again, this idea of a measurement. Actually, I just I wanted to make a title, The Measurement Problem, then I realized in quantum me uh, mechanics there is the, the measurement problem is actually well-defined, so I cannot use that term. Um, but in architecture, we have this measurement issue uh, in a sense that everything that we build has to be measured before. Um, and somehow the drawings that we do, they have to be related to the, um, uh, to, to, the, to the physical world. And we do this with relatively crude instruments, so kind of measuring tape and so on. Um, so we're not talking about 3D scanners here, but kind of crude tools. Uh, in order to overcome this problem of measurement, we through history, we were inventing, we were inventing tools that not only enable us to avoid measurement altogether, because the, maybe the machine is doing the measurement, but also to enable us to work more efficiently. So, kind of production machines. So, you know, we want to do rotating columns. Here's the machine. We want to do a spline, curved walls. Here's the here's your machine. Um, but most of the machines that we used in the last 200 years since the uh, industrial revolution are very they're very powerful, but they're also very simple or very, very crude. So they can do one task. But of course, the world is composed out of very complex objects. And um, in order to do these complex assemblies, we had to kind of put in human back into the loop. So the whole idea of this uh, automated factory production it turns out involves a lot of human labor. Until recently, until we kind of invented, basically, we replaced, we reinvented the worker. Because we reinvented sort of the hand. Uh, we reinvent, kind of made machines work for us. Uh, and these basically machines are what builds your houses, or sorry, builds your um, cars today and basically everything else you see, laptops, mobile phones, TVs, and so on. They're all built like this because they're all the same. A little bit of maybe variation, but most of them are the same. But architecture, we cannot build like this, or at least we don't 
we don't build it yet. And somehow there's still this kind of hope that maybe this is how we will build in the future. I don't believe in that. I, I think this is not even the past. This is kind of the future past. So what we thought uh, would happen in the future but never did, except in some rare occasions. Uh, because history, of course, teaches us that throughout history we were able to build very differ differentiated structures. Or, so I, I don't see why would we go you know, from this into the future that looks like this, or I don't think this will, this will happen. I think we'll go back to building highly differentiated structures because it makes a lot of sense. It's um, sufficient, or, you know, efficient use of material. It's, um, it's, it's, very, it's very varied in a sense that you can embed sort of cultural ad identities in these structures themselves. So it's not only about performance, it's about aesthetics, it's about kind of leaving an imprint. You can almost, you know, all these vaults, I don't even have to tell you where they're from, because you know they're all from the, you know, Western Europe. Um, when I show you this, you know where it comes from, or you know where it could come from. It doesn't come from Western Europe. Um, and so on, you know, so there, we are kind of embedding not only geometry, but also the whole cultural heritage, maybe, um, of civilizations and, and societies. And that's why I think the, this will kind of prevail, especially in the future. Um, but of course, it's very hard to build like this today, uh, because we kind of lost these people. We lost this. The economy changed. We, um, yeah, we uh, somehow the labor got more specialized, uh, left less kind of crafty, and and uh, and so on. So, because we lost these people, we, we cannot build these things anymore, or at least kind of until recently we couldn't build it. But you know now there's you know we invented our own our own workers now, and there, that's the actor from the previous uh, few slides before. This is actually quite a, it's kind of a stupid machine, but it does exactly what you tell it to do, and if you give it 10,000 different instructions, it'll do 10,000 different things. Um, and, and this is actually a very powerful concept, or because humans cannot do this. I cannot give you a plan with 10,000 instructions and expect you to do it, but this machine can do it. Uh, yeah, before they take over the world, <laughs> Uh, we have to become friends with them. Okay, and you know, and if, especially because today uh, these tools are already, or the, these robots are basically integrated in, the, um, in our CAD and environments. Also, I use Rhino to draw, um, and I can use it to control these machines. So, you know, we are kind of very, very close. I can kind of make the robot pretend to be an artist. Of course, the robot is not the artist, I'm the, I'm the artist. But I can kind of make it do creative things for me, or for us. I can also make it build build things. So it's basically this worker that I just claimed before that we kind of lost. Um, uh, we maybe kind of managed to re re in reinvent it. I'll just run super quickly through the projects. Um, you know, so all these projects are actually, I, um, I was either a student or a teacher in these projects. So 2009, almost, uh, almost 10 years. Uh, you know, this is how we built that back then when we didn't have the small robots. So we did a lot of hand models. This is basically nothing else but the measurement machine. So it's a projector, projects the, the, uh, the, the, plan, of the, the plan of the column uh, onto the model, and you can kind of use it to build, and there's a platform that goes up and down. So this is basically this kind of fabrication machine or manual fabrication machine. You can produce these models uh, like this directly, kind of, or almost directly from a computer. Um, of course, in the physical world, or, uh, even if you have the robot, you cannot do much more than what you can do with your hand. So this is basically this, or so um, you can just do it. You cannot even do it maybe faster. You cannot do it more precise, but um, but at least the robot doesn't have to measure, or so it can kind of uh, it can do things that we necessarily could not because we would need too many reference points. And uh, again, I don't have to explain you this. This you all know um, from the context of the building that you're in. But you know we can kind of extend this further. So this was a. Uh, 2011 kind of idea is okay. We have a kind of a magazine that's kind of a 3D printer. I'm very interested in this idea of low res 3D printing. I don't think 3D printing should be very you know granular. If these are our 3D printing pieces, um, then you know we can achieve architectural scale much quicker. Um, Son worked on this project uh, way way back, and Volker, who is not here anymore, and the David actually, who is uh, he's busy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and of course these pieces can be highly differentiated, or, or you can kind of have pieces that are all a little bit different. 
um, but kind of through the way that you put them together, through these few degrees of freedom that you have, you can kind of create very differentiated surfaces. And this was actually a project then done last uh, summer, on which uh, Stefana, me, and David worked with the previous uh, MS generation. You have kind of a similar idea. There is the, the magazine. And uh, yeah, it's basically just a big 3D printer. It just takes very long. Uh, but um, yeah, so it's kind of thinking about 3D printing in the architectural scale involves, I would claim, it involves also this thinking about resolution. And brick is a quite a good resolution, uh, or quite a good kind of pixel or voxel in that sense. Uh, you can go on, so here these projects, they kind of they involve this progression of joints. So you have kind of the most generic joint, this kind of round-to-round -round profile that you achieve the connection just through proximity. So you have a lot of kind of geometric freedom. Stefana is actually just finishing her PhD on, uh, on uh, these structures. Uh, but this was this we did with the students way back, and uh, it was kind of uh, well, good kind of ex exploration to do. Um, and you can of course then scale it up. This is actually quite a difficult project to to execute, but you know, in a sense, you have a very generic connection because once when the elements touch, you do a hole through and put a cable binder. You can go toward more specific connections. Also, this one is side to side; only orthogonal directions are allowed. You would think that this is sort of something that how all the projects would look like because if you're not allowed to do any angle, you know, how else could it look like? But it turns out you can do quite a few things. Um, but here, of course, you're already, you know, if you lost the, if the joint is not generic anymore, or if it's more specific, that means you encoded the information in that, in that joint. And here, of course, it's encoded because the, there are only four ways or four sides that you can connect to. Uh, two elements from R. So just by having this constraint, you actually reduce the amount of possibilities. You made the joint more specific. Um, and um, in this project here, we went even, so went even more toward the specificity. So we said, OK, now we are even we are cutting the elements. So you know the angle, this plane is kind of tied to the element itself. So it's, in a sense, the geometric information is encoded in the element. And of course, you still have some freedom because you have kind of, well, one rotational degree of freedom uh, and translational degree of freedom, let's say. But, but in a sense, um, here we are moving to more specific joints. Or, um, but still, the other, so the question is, how does the other um, geometric information get into the structure? Of course, that's through the actuation of the robot. So the robot is the one that provides all the other, um, all the other, all the other degrees of freedom. Actually, this is Andreas's project. Uh, way back in 2013. Uh, and uh, yeah, when you scale this up, kind of something very similar, don't do wooden joints like this. Uh, the other project has a bit better, yeah, don't, don't, don't do them like this. So screw along the grain, not good. Uh, and this was actually quite a fast production, so only three days. Once when it, well, everything was working, which of course it was not working for very long. And um, this one, of course, then uh, the first MS generation, uh, Jesus, Fabio, that's it. Uh, we're working on this one uh, where the idea is, yeah, we kind of wanted to build kind of a whole house. So um, there was a roof, a balustrade wall, and a kind of floor, uh, all the different elements, and um, all the kind of different chunks that were put together. And basically, topologically, all these modules are the same, or they are just uh, deformed. But when you have... Uh, spatially defined module that is stiff. Even if you deform it, it's still stiff because a triangle, if you deform it, it's still a stiff. It's still stiff. <laughs> so uh, so the, the tetraeder, even if it's, um, um, or prism, if it's uh, stiff before it was deformed, it will be stiff after it's deformed. I'll not talk too much about this because of course there's Arsh here and Andreas also who are uh, working. Uh, uh, the research goes in this direction, so I, I don't want to say anything that I will be reproached for after. Um, but yeah, it's a bit over, over dimensioned, but it was also kind of a short time. Um, quite a fun project to work on. Um, and uh, this is the last part <laughs> of the presentation. Uh, again, kind of, now I'll talk just a little bit kind of historical overview of the, of the kind of drawing or how we invented and reinvented drawing tools, and how this basically then in turn defined who, who is the architect or who, who is the author of the building. So 
So Berti basically defined the role of the architect, defined the role of an architect as the author of the building because we are we are the ones who draw the building. So through the act of drawing, um, we become authors. Um, in a sense, of course, somebody else builds it. Maybe we even build it or help to build it. But but you know, it doesn't matter what happens afterward. We are the authors because we are the ones who who, who drew the design. And uh, for Alberti, drawing was not uh, was not just artistic activity. It was it was a technical discipline. Or so the perspective is in a sense constructed. It's constructed again through drawing machines um, in a very precise way. And of course, these ones are then used also for measurement, like uh, in um, for measuring for land surveys and so on. So this is also a drawing machine. This is this um, actually amazing project from Alberti or a concept. He kind of, um, he defined basically, so this was in the 15th century, he defined all the, um, he defined all the, the polar coordinates of all the monuments in Rome back in that time as a kind of code. Um, because he believed, this was before invention of the printing press, before it, we invented the printing press, it was hard to convey visual information. And he kind of assumed the best way to convey it is through writing instructions how to execute a drawing. And then whoever wants to see the drawing, you can kind of just repeat the instructions and reconstruct, the, uh, reconstruct this polar map. Um, so this was done, what is that, like 500 years later. Um, or redrawn 500 years later. And of course, if you know how the computers or how your screens work, this is exactly how the screens work. So, so there is a very very high fidelity stream of bits going through these um, cables that are basically just a code and tells your computer, um, tells your screen basically exactly which pixel has to be drawn where and when. Um, it's just uh, the Alberti's one was done by hand, so it was a bit kind of shorter. So, and this is kind of, again, related to this other invention. So we invented kind of artificial builders, but we also invented um, a different form of script. Also, this is kind of a narrative script, and this is sort of a, this is basically computer code, and they use similar or they use the same. I would say the, uh, it's not the same language. They use the same um, same signs or same letters. Uh, even the words are similar, but um, the left one is meant to be read by humans, so it operates in natural language, and the other one is completely formal language. So it's basically like math, um, and it's used to be read by machines. And um, and again. You know, well now we invented sort of a language to talk with machines. Now, because we are architects, you know, we can kind of, uh, you know, machines, they, they, of course, always do things for us. They, they uh, machines build for us. So this was kind of a 24,000 punch cards to create the, the carpet of uh, Monsieur Jacquard. This is Jacquard's loom. So it's basically um, like a big carpet printing machine from the, this, is, this one is actually from the 20th century, but the earlier version was uh, in the 19th century. Um, yeah, so there's somehow correlation between the data. So this is uh, just a punch card, basically G-code of this object that was fabricated in this machine. Or so there's somehow data, fabrication machines, um, physical objects. They're kind of linked. And uh, so, you know, again, there are kind of no humans in this loop. Once when this is produced, once when the code is done, uh, it's made, it's a kind of, it, you know, the machine can just produce the piece. So somehow the, the human builder is out of the loop here, except in the, except as a designer. And this is this promise of technology that we can, okay, you know, we can use this technology to kind of now build, uh, build again very differentiated forms um, because we have this kind of very brilliant or this very kind of amazing technology that works for us. Basically CNC controlled the routers and so on. Um, this is a small digression, but um, I'm actually always inspired how nature works. So nature does not work with <laughs> does not work on this scale. Nature works on a nanoscale, nature works with molecules. And if, if you talk about uh, functional grading of materials, you have very few materials that you combine together in a very, very specific way, and you get all the multitude of you know, life and, and biodiversity that you see. Um, so you have to be able, or nature basically builds on a, on a nanoscale. And today we can also kind of do something similar so if they're still far off, so this is a bit maybe ridiculous, but we can sort of nanoprint. And of course, when we build things that are this small, or even when we manipulate material on this level, we cannot do it by hand anymore. Also here, kind of this paradigm of digital production is not an option anymore, it is a necessity. And 
this is how we drew plans before. Um, and we kind of, you know, we, we drew them through approximations, so plans, sections, elevations. Um, in the meantime, we invent, you know, we kind of invented computers, so we started drawing on a computer. Um, and this is how we designed today. So this is, in a sense, a drawing, but it's, it's more like a three-dimensional drawing or a three-dimensional model. And, uh, well, at least in Switzerland, a lot of offices work like this. They work kind of directly in 3D. Um, so, you know, it's not a 2D drawing, it's not an approximation. It is some kind of approximation because there's no material information in it for now. Um, and it gives us a lot more freedom. More so we are not constrained to these traditional drawing tools. So we don't have to use rulers, compasses, pentagraphs, and so on. Um, we can just work with, um, you know, completely free three-dimensional geometry like splines and so on. So somehow, you know, we, we don't have to design anymore with straight lines. We can just work directly with curved lines. Um, and, not and not only that, we can encode other information in our models. That's why I, I'm very reluctant to call them drawings. Because, of course, this model contains not only the geometrical information, but also the sequence. So all these numbers are basically sequences. So I can encode sequence information. And not only that, but I can... I can tell the model how it needs to build itself. So the model can communicate, I, I can give you a model on a file, and this model, because it's basically, <laughs> it's basically code, or the code has inbuilt methods, and the code tells the machine, this is how you build me, you know? So you have this kind of very, uh, how do I call it, kind of, I wouldn't, wouldn't call them smart, but sort of a very highly kind of compact representations of your buildings that are not only geometrical information, but also, you know, time sequence and, and production information and so on. And this becomes possible when we, uh, when, our, when we don't work with drawings anymore, but kind of design through, through code. This enables us then, of course, to, because everything is parameterized, I can explore, I don't explore one by one option anymore, I can explore kind of the whole array uh, of options that I can choose between them. Um, and in a sense, what computers gave us, or again, this kind of promise of computers, is that we can simulate, so we, it's not only that we can draw on them, we can also simulate the world itself. So we can simulate material processes and so on. Um, turns out that in the world, everything kind of happens at the same time, so a little bit like this kind of flock of birds. Um, but kind of when you work with code, we have to think a little bit like a musical score, or so everything becomes a sequence. But turns out there is actually a way of discretizing space and time in order to translate the physical world into the, into the digital world. So, you know, you can have a grid. You say every point on this grid is kind of a small cell that uh, operates according to these instructions. It's a mathematical formula. I can simulate fluid dynamics, for example. I can go a step further. Uh, so this is a project that I did as a student way, way, way back, uh, where I can say, okay, you know, I, I don't simulate fluids, I simulate cities. Or I take this pattern, you know, pattern number two from Christopher Alexander, I want to kind of simulate it. And simulate it, turns out everything becomes kind of, uh, you get into this equilibrium very fast and everything is super boring. But in these fractions of seconds before I get the actual equilibrium, I get kind of interesting formations. So, you know, these are kind of particles or particle spring systems specifically, but it's just directly translated from Christopher Al Alexander's rules for how cities should be spaced around. Or so I can kind of, I can play a little bit with these scales. Of course, these techniques are uh, employed today in the entertainment industry. So this is Dwarf Fortress, a computer game. Um, and, um, and not only that, it's not only that I can kind of simulate the world, but I can sort of load my world into the computer. Or I can actually take the, I can kind of do 3D scanning, or I can 3D scan the world, and I can actually take the actual world information and put it in a computer and work with it. And this, I'll show you now the last, uh, string of projects um, that deal with this a little bit. So kind of the idea is that uh, ah, this actually Andreas worked on this. Yes. Uh, also, so this is my in in intentional. Uh, this is my design or the circle here, and this is what I get. Um, so you know, there's kind of discrepancy between the intention and and um, and the outcome. And yeah, to do this, so we have to kind of you know, it's not only enough to have this kind of code and designer behind the computer or the actuation machine, kind of the artificial builder, I need one more element, so I need kind of eyes. I need, a computer needs eyes. Uh, Material-driven fabrication, 
just quickly go through the last three projects. Um, again, very old project, 2011, uh, where we work with sand, um, sand casts for concrete. Um, there's this discrepancy between the kind of design in or sort of, uh, let's say, how, uh, what we see on a computer and what we get in the real world. This is what we see in a computer, just speed curves. But this is what we get in the physical world. Also, I manipulate the speed, and I get different, different uh, heights of different dunes, and I can then shift them and so on. So I never see this directly in a computer. But if I can kind of execute it very fast, I can prototype it in the real world. The world is the best simulation um, out there. Or, um, and I can use this then to cast uh, concrete on. I can use the same idea where I just kind of move the sand around. So this is, again, what I see in a computer. I just see these rotation curves. Um, but in the physical world, I get something, something like this. Um, and if I can jump quickly between this, you know, fast prototyping, and you know what I kind of draw here, then I can actually design with that, or I don't actually have to simulate anything in a computer directly. Um, yeah, this one works just kind of with stamping. So this is red sand. Um, we work with these kind of tensor fields, and you can pour concrete directly on it because hydrophobic. It's also used in metal casting industry. Uh, in art, f art, art, uh, art f uh, foundries and so on. Um, and this is how the kind of pieces look like in the end. So, or we can kind of look at this idea of uh, remote material deposition. So we kind of invert, we invert, um, the co um, invert this, invert the way the free printer works. Also, free printers usually have to be a bit bigger. They encompass the, the elements that they build or that they print. And uh, they're already actually um, some examples of uh, printers that's kind of uh, they don't envelop the piece, but they kind of just can sort of extend the reach. And here, of course, we do it with a, we can do it basically ballistically, so we can just pr shoot the material out um, because there is this material behavior, but also this kind of stochastic uncertainty. So we don't know if the piece landed exactly where it uh, should have. Did Anna work on this project? Yes, correct. Anna worked on this. Um, Wow, I actually had quite a lot of students. <laughs> okay. Yes, this is Petrus's wife, correct. Uh, Sela, yes, yes. Um, and maybe this is Anna on the, on the table, filling in. Uh, or Maya, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, there's the 3D camera here, scanning what happens, loading in, and tuk, 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 tuk. Uh, we have this kind of loop, call it the feedback fabrication loop. Um, large scale. Piece. Ah, Andreas worked on yeah, Andreas worked on the, this large scale one. Again, this one fits in a trunk. There's a computer here and 3D camera on the top. Um, we designed with ballistic curves, and uh, again, there's this material behavior in um, the robot is here, and there's kind of a spread um, that goes radially from the robot because, of course, the further we shoot, we get kind of a lower angle, so the elements tend to kind of bounce bounce off. You have more imprecision here, so the elements are, or the walls are bigger. Here, of course, when we shoot, we have exactly the, um, the vertical trajectory, so here the wall was also the highest. We decided to have it highest here. This is how it looks like. And um, I also worked on this one, yes. Spatial free printing, so super boring. Oh, I'm just going to fall asleep before I finish this. Uh, well, because you saw this so, so many times, probably. But, you know, it, it enables us then to go beyond this kind of layer, layer-based um, free printing into kind of really spatial free printing. We can work in functional grading, so change the density of material. Again, if you do this on a nanoscale, we basically approach the way nature works. So that's kind of a big motivation, at least for me. You can kind of print in air. You can print kind of with huge um, um, extensions. Uh, and um, and yeah, this is then the kind of the biggest, the big piece that we then built for Paris, uh, where we also used color. So we had a pigment um, kind of a filament that had uh, kind of changes in pigmentation, so we could kind of track the. Uh, we didn't lose this kind of sequencing information in the final piece. Whereas, for example, here you cannot actually read the sequence anymore. You can just read the direction of gravity, but here. You can uh, you can actually do it uh, because you can just follow the color. And actually, that's it. Um, I uh, just want to finish with this one here, uh, just just for that. So because the, I have this obsession, I uh, kind of have a obsessive compulsive disorder, and I 
kind of draw all the time. And I'm collecting, collecting things. And then I'm putting them in this blog, but I kind of, now the, if you go on the blog, it's still in 2015, so I'm a bit three years behind um, with posting. Although I'm posting all the time, but I, there's just too much things happening. And this is sort of, a, again, a bit reflects back to, you know, how we, how we create. Also, you know, again, computers are fine and so on, but very often the way, best way to structure your ideas is through some other mediums. It can be through hand building, it can be through drawing, um, and it can be through lecturing, like what I'm doing right now. And I uh, would encourage you all to find this way of kind of productive, productive mode of creating. I think this is very, very important. I think I kind of nailed mine. This works for me for now, at least. Um, but, you know, uh, I think uh, if we want to be creative individuals, we have to kind of find different modes of working. You know, these are fine. But you kind of stand behind them your whole day. Um, so it's not only inventing, you know, creative things. It's about inventing the means to be creative. And if you ever have students, then also teach them this. Uh, don't make them narrow mind and make them very uh, open, open minded. OK, that's actually the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Orkun. Thank you, Luca. Th thank you, Luca, uh, very much for this uh, very um, extensive presentation. It's always amazing to see how much you touched, like how many things you've been involved with throughout your time here. And also, thank you for showing us your new adventures, your new uh, uh, projects. I think uh, they're also quite interesting, especially because they differ from what you did here, but somehow follow also. Up with your um, sketches, with your thoughts, and uh, uh, I think we all enjoy seeing that. And with that, um, I want to open the floor for questions, if you have any. So I am teaching now in Finland, <laughs> and they told me uh, the Finns never ask any questions. But I never left a single lecture without having at least one question. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, people tend to, people tend to relax even, even, even up there. Um, I have a question. Yes, Petrus. Petrus, uh, can you have your key? <laughs> Thank you, I have to stand up. <laughs> so, great to see you again. Welcome home. Or back. <laughs> um, what do you think about uh, robots in general? So now you're kind of into AI. And do you think, just in general, the technology that generates the architecture? Now I have to reformulate it. Uh -huh. a bit. But um, do you think the robot is kind of necessary to build the architecture of tomorrow or the machine? Or is it just a medium? Can we use augmented reality? Could we use something else? And then the real question is, how do we design things? Is the robot just a state in the designing question? Or is the machine how we build and how we continue to build? In the, in the future? Well, now, I mean, yeah. But tomorrow is already the future somehow. True, true. Even now is already the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually never understood really this, or I did understand, but I, um, this, there's this, fas or op I wouldn't say obsession, but a kind of fascination with robots. They're re they are kind of amazing machines, but I think it's just a step. I don't think it's the end state, state step, I think it's just an in-between step. Because Again, um, the way I like to think about these topics, I always uh, look at nature as an inspiration. I actually just had a last workshop I had in uh, Helsinki, the whole topic was nature and how nature builds. Um, and but we worked with algorithm. Or we worked. Uh, the topic was kind of algorithm design, but looked could we kind of lens of nature because I think here we all a little bit understand that all the things that we do, we are kind of some of them are new, but most of them are just somehow rediscovered, either, you know, or reinvented um, old construction techniques that we kind of reappropriated for the new age. Or some things we just com completely, you know, took over from nature, and I think that we are, you know, I'm kind of thinking the r nature doesn't use robots to 
construct, to build, to create. So that's why for me, I'm kind of thinking maybe the end state is, you know, it, it is just a, the end state is not a robot, you know, it's not even 3D printers. I don't know exactly what it is, but I don't think it's that mechanical in that sense. For me, this is just a stage, or this is how, how I see it. Um, you know, just think about how, uh, how life grows, how, uh, how you know, uh, a tree is made. And there's kind of no external actuator. Ev everything happens, you know, from, from inside. So at MIT, uh, Scholar Tibbetts self assembly lab goes a little bit, of course, in this direction, saying, you know, we can kind of have elements that sort of self, or we can have uh, artifacts that sort of self-assemble. I think this is, the, um, this is the future. We are now living in the, it's not a pre-industrial, it's not a post-industrial, but I think it's this very kind of, a little bit still very mechanistic way of looking at the world, almost dating back to enlightenment, you know, where you know, the solar system is the clock and um, the, you know, the human is um, um, whatever, you know, kind of this very articulate organism or very articulate kind of mechanism. And now, of course, we, we are kind of thinking, oh, no, no, human, we are not like robots, we are not machines, we are, we, you know, we are like computers or our brain is like a computer. And this is, of course, still an approximation. Um, so I think there are kind of new, new stages to come. Sorry, very long answer to your question, but uh, in general, um, yeah, I think this is just a stage, and I think it might actually be rather a temporary one, although it could be that for the next 100 years we'll build like this. So it will definitely be, become more prominent, and as always in history of human civilization, um, always the, the, you know, the, the biggest necessity always forced us to change the way we, we do things. So, um, you know, maybe then space exploration is in that sense uh, will drive certain um, developments forward because when we come to, the, for example, to Mars, we are not going to build the way that we are building here. Um, then kind of all the all bets are off because we will not transport construction workers up. Uh, you know, we are going to build in a different way and maybe then this kind of will feed back uh, here and so on. The same way that a lot of technology was then developed by kind of pioneers and colonists um, to the new world and so on. Um, yeah, I think it's just a stage. I'm looking to this, I think the end state we cannot even foresee quite yet. There are some murky, murky things in the future. Uh, thank you, Luca, for the great lecture. Um, I have a question about the first part that you showed, mm -hmm. um, what you're up to now. And I cannot scroll back it. because it's 300 slides in the, it's okay. in the <laughs> back. Um, where do you want to go with this? Because it was also for me um, the first time to see it with your new um, teaching activities in Finland. Like, is this a part of your studio? Like, Where would you like to go with the neural networks? You have showed a lot of Mm -hmm. Very cool explanation of the feature trackings and all. And is this going to be a part of your um, design studio or uh, coming is, back from yeah. fabrication background? How mm -hmm. will you kind of um, will you integrate it to some kind of fabrication studio or activity? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, currently, it is just a research project. Um, currently, just a research project. Um, um, the studios now are, because of course, um, so in Helsinki we are starting a little bit up over, so really kind of from the beginning, the, um, the culture is, or the, somehow the school is actually very progressive in the direction of kind of art and design, very kind of sort of hands-on, uh, but also very traditional. So these things that, um, even like kind of algorithm design scripting, the idea of drawing through scripting is super new, but um, I'm kind of very hopeful. I had this one workshop now where there was somehow this pressure <laughs> we should work in grasshopper because somehow, I don't know, 22-year-olds are, I'm not going to say idiots, but, you know, kind of the, the idea is, no, no, I want to say that uh, they tried to, con or someone tried to convince me that the students that are kind of, you know, uh, uh, 20 to 25, that somehow they, they will not get scripting and then we have to work in grasshopper. Um, or that kind of it would be desirable, so we worked a little bit with gra or one part was in Grasshopper, but then I just completely switched to Python and I said, you can look at Grasshopper at home, you have all the stuff online, but I will teach you a little bit different way of working. 
And then there was always this, but could you do this in graphs? Well, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but I'll, I'll show you how to do it differently. And um, then I was now just last week in Malta where we did kind of grasshopper workshops. But basically, uh, yeah, then it turns out that these um, architecture school students who kind of, you know, draw basically by hand still in the first years there, uh, yeah, they can get into scripting. So I'm kind of, you know, so it turns out, okay, so th this, this we did. So somehow it turns out the student, you know, it's not the students who are the problem, it's the teachers, so our kind of preconceptions. Um, and if you ask me, my goal is in one year to integrate this research, the AI research into design work. How does this exactly happen? Not exactly sure, but um, I think we also have to, you know, I think we just kind of have to go into it because my assumption is as soon as they're always smarter than their teachers are more creative just because, you know, um, they, uh, of course, they're usually very receptive to new ideas. And when you're receptive to ideas, you can also be very creative in it. Whereas, uh, the, I wouldn't say the older you get, but, you know, I'm also already kind of old, you know, I, my, my ways are already set. So um, I cannot even predict, you know, certain things. I, I don't have the clear view where could they lead, but that's the whole point of uh, academia. It should be, it should be uh, experimental. So yeah, ideally this would also be included in the design work. And it sounds a little bit crazy, but, but it's actually a necessity. Otherwise it will die out, it will become a paper here, paper there, but it will not really, it will not become part of the architectural discourse because the art, it's not architects who will do them, it's gonna, it's gonna, some, gonna be some engineers and so on. And I think the architects should, be, should deal with this and designers. Um, yeah, of course, necessity. We have to um, have to educate ourselves um, more and more. You know, so these things they don't come easy. Uh, you have to, you know, they don't teach us linear algebra uh, in an architecture school. A little bit of kind of vector operations, but um, but for this you need linear algebra, you need calculus, you need uh, statistics, and none of these are standard in architectural school. So and that makes it harder. But this 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 might change. Uh, just as um, maybe 10 years ago, nobody was thinking that programming could be part of the architecture curriculum. And I heard here at ETH, at least, there are some moves to introduce that quite early early on. Yeah, so I'm hopeful. I'm trying to be kind of at the head of this curve, uh, just tracking behind. Fabrication, of course, that's the only thing that is relevant because we are dealing with physical, or at least for me, we are dealing with physical objects. I'm not, I'm not actually really interested in neural networks. I am really interested in the final part that I showed you, the, the wood that is made out of copper. This is what I'm interested in, because this is for me almost like alchemy. And this, if you want to have, yeah, and anyway, so this is kind of my kind of end goal, to create on a scale that the nature builds. And for that, we cannot use hands, that's for sure. Miro, wait a minute, there, there are some MA students here. I, I want to question from an MA student, not the former one, uh, the current MA students. Maybe they're too tired. I like. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Or is it necessary to have no, no, an no, MA no. student? No, no. So what, uh, what I find very interesting is the first part and then the second part. Yeah? So there you have a kind of an abstract machine learning and then you have a kind of a poetry or a storytelling in, in terms of this thing mm -hmm. then and, and, and so on. So, and then in the first part you had this kind of statement of, of three epochs, yeah, or how do you call it, three paradigms. paradigms yeah. Yeah. So the third paradigm, mm -hmm. of course, that, the, the tricky one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there you say it's a generation or... True, true examples. True examples. Mm -hmm. And then you have generation through examples, and then you have machine intelligence or machine learning or artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So this means first you take the human out because you have the machine intelligence, and then you say we generate by examples, which means that in principle we, all we have is a kind of combinatorial element of everything that happened, but there is no way to, to create new, and there is no way to, to be an architect. So by looking at this as an architect, you need to have a different conceptual approach in, in my understanding mm -hmm. towards this. Yeah? So I think what we gain with machine intelligence is a new way of thinking about the world in general. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So how can we deal with a lot? How can we deal with thousands of floor plans? How can we deal with thousands of pictures, thousands of this, thousands of that? 
but the, the generative or the creative part is both outside of the machine intelligence and it's both outside of the examples. So for this, then we need to rethink what is the role of an architect in this, in, in yeah. this kind of uh, setup. Yeah. I agree that uh, the role of, a, of an architect should be retaught, and it is correct that this third paradigm uh, was, I would say, unintentionally a little bit subversive, um, in a sense, or potentially it could be very subversive because it, as you correctly pointed out, potentially completely eliminates the architect out of the loop, uh, or as a designer. I, just, just in the way how you presented it. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Um, that's why I said uh, you should challenge me. Um, because, you know, these thoughts are always, you know, they are kind of still, still quite new in my head. Um, it is true that you could look at it in a way, or that I may present it in a way that you take architect completely out of the loop. And uh, I don't have a clear statement on this, but this might be, this might even be unavoidable. I, don't, I, I think here it's crucial to, to, to distinguish machine intelligence from human intelligence, mm -hmm. because these things in principle are not in competition. So there are different kinds of intelligence that do different things. And then the, what would be interesting is to think how we can relate both in, in doing certain thing. But if we look at them as a competition, then you are in this loop where, in principle, the human loses. Uh, correct. Yeah, correct. Uh, there's this, I actually don't have this slide uh, here, but I'm sure to put it uh, in my next presentation. There's this very, very nice kind of illustration. There's kind of a bird and the fighter jet, and kind of the idea is, uh, you know, which one is more performative, and then kind of, well, the fighter jet is faster, it can kind of kill you. Uh, and so on. So you can kind of look at the uh, fighter jet as kind of more performative flying machine, but uh, you know s somehow the the bird is more versatile. And you know, so it's, it's it's really this kind of we can actually create, in that sense, machine intelligence that can outperform humans trillion times, like AlphaGo, for example, which is now even you know a joke. No one can play go anymore with uh, with uh, with the machine. But it doesn't you know. And then we, now we go into the direction. You know, is the question of this general intelligence, what does that mean, and does this actually pose a um, danger not only to architects, but kind of to us as a species in general? So these are kind of much broader questions. Uh, but yeah, but I think we should kind of think, think, think about these things, because again, one of the first slides was Photoshop. And uh, I don't know if you, so just go into Photoshop and play around with it. So you can complete things, but you can kind of, you can take an object, and you can select it, you can do select inverse, so you select everything around, and you say fill content aware. And that's basically this extrapolation. So basically you're kind of filling in the surrounding of the object, or the Photoshop is filling the surrounding of the object, by trying to kind of predict how could the surrounding of this object look like. And I think that's kind of a, that's also a form of designing. Of course the computer is doing the designing, but you are the one who is the moderator, you know? So the, these tools are kind of already out there, and. And, and now they're working Photoshop and so on, but very soon they'll be in whatever, AutoCAD, ARCHICAD, and so on, and we have to learn to deal with them. We cannot avoid them. And we have to also have a, have a stance about, you know, about them, and ideally we should be the ones who develop them. Um, yeah, but thank you for, if this is a really good question. Okay, um, thank you very much, Luca. Uh, more questions? I didn't see any hands. Okay. Looks like there are no mm. questions. <laughs> Everybody wants but to But thank go you home. very much for um, <laughs> coming. Uh, I always enjoy lecturing because, um, as you know, I always I just like I like to talk in general. We know that. <laughs> so this is never a problem for me. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it's of course nice to be that, in this. Yeah, amazing that's why we asked you here, Mr. So Dutton. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Always okay. a pleasure. Well, thank you, Luca, and thank you, everyone. Um, see you in the next lecture. Bye.